Well, this is the response. Now I'm talking about unorthodox monetary policy. Unorthodox monetary policy is um, otherwise known as quantitative easing. Um, it's got a long history and in, in, in one, one time old-fashioned people will know it as open market operations and um, it, um, it, it was a, it came the pe reason people adopted um, quantitative easing in 2009 2010 there was a, there was a very well-known study by Friedman and Schwartz um, on the um, Great Depression and they attributed the length and depth of the Great Depression um, to the failure of the Federal Reserve Board to sustain the money supply by pursuing bond purchases without limits. It failed to buy bonds to whatever extent was necessary to maintain the money supply. That was their analysis of why this uh, line went down for so long um, and, and, and the, the crisis was so deep. And that was the lesson that Ben Bernanke, who was the f chairman of the Fed, drew from the Great Depression. And this is what he said before the, the Great Recession started. In 2006, he said, by allowing persistent declines in the money supply and in the price level, the Federal Reserve of the late 1920s and 1930s greatly stabilized the American economy. Notice the word allow. It allowed these great declines in the money supply and the price level. Implicitly, it could have prevented them. And that, is the, that was the basis of quantitative easing. It could prevent these declines by buying bonds, by buying government securities without limited and, and feeding the banks and the non-banks with money. Yeah? Now, that's the issue. That's the issue, really, we have to think about. Um, could it actually do this? Um, now, this was supposed to be the transmission mechanism that the Bank of England thought would work, right? Oh, sorry, 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 I've, I've got ahead of myself. First of all, let's think of the orthodox transmission mechanism. How does the bank normally expect its interest, interest rate policy, which was the pre-crash policy, to um, influence the economy? Ah. Um, what am I, where am I meant to be doing? Okay. Okay, this is how it was supposed to work before the crash. The bank set the official interest rate, yeah? Then you had these channels, that, the, that affected market rates, and um, that is the rate set, set by the banks for their loans. It affected asset prices, it affected expectations, and it influenced the exchange rate. And then all that goes along into total demand and then into the price level or inflation level, yeah? So via interest rate setting, through these transmission channels, you influence total demand in the economy and therefore they put inflation. I could have just e as well written nominal income depending on where the economy was. But if it was assumed to be at full employment, then it's just the inflation. That was how it was supposed to work in the, in the, um, in the uh, pre-crash period. The, when, when the economy seemed to be, you know, uh, in maybe some decline in demand, total demand, you cut, the bank rate was cut, and therefore market rates would be cut, asset prices would go up, expectations uh, because they were um, uh, they knew that the, the the bank would do this would be stabilized and the exchange rate would 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 um, would decline and so that would open up the export channel <coughs> um, now the problem is what happens when you get into this situation You have a decline in IS, but 
you can't get you can't get interest rates down you have the liquidity trap this is uh, I mean, this isn't quite Keynes's liquidity trap, it's Krugman's liquidity trap. But basically, interest rate policy is disabled. You can't get the interest rate down below zero. But maybe, maybe the uh, marginal efficiency of capital or the expectation of profit has actually, look where it is, you see. You need, to, you should really be able to get um, the, the interest rate down, but you can't get it down below the lower bound, which is zero, basically zero. So you have to use some other, other kinds of policy. And that's exactly where um, quantitative easing comes in. Uh, and what is the objective of pumping the economy full of money. Interest rate you've already got down. Interest rate is already zero, near zero. They cut their rates very, very rapidly in 2008, 2009, 0.5% and even lower, but they couldn't get them any lower than that. So they, then they, they used this other tool, which was unconventional monetary policy. What was the object of unconventional monetary policy? Well, the technical object of, of unconventional monetary policy was to reverse the fall in the inflation rate. Um, because what was happening was that, you know, in terms of bank's objective, inflation was falling below the inflation target. That would normally have led to a cut in interest rates, but the shock was so great that int even if you once you'd reduce, reduced interest rates to near zero, you still were below inflation target. And the prediction was that inflation would remain below the inflation target of 2%, 2.5% for a number of years ahead. So the object, technical object, uh, of, of the um, unconventional monetary easing was to lift the rate of inflation um, and uh, none of this was very well understood by the way they'd forgotten really about how to do it because it hadn't been in the in the in the equipment of the central banks for a long time and so basically you know you raise the inflation rate a bit um, if you can uh, and that's good for confidence or you actually have a direct in, in, in impact on output um, via increase in, in, in bank lending. Um, they didn't really know how it was going to work, broadly speaking. Um, but they thought that it must be a good thing. And I won't give you the figures, um, but uh, there was a huge amount of quantitative easing. For example, well, I'll give you a couple of figures. In the, in the United Kingdom, they pumped £250 billion pounds into the <coughs> economy over a period of two years. Um, yeah, I think that actually 275 billion pounds and in the United States it was much more like a trillion, well over a trillion dollars um, and um, these were very large sums uh, and uh, uh, well what, how did they think it would work? There were two transmission mechanisms specified <coughs> but before we get on to them how do you think, how do you think the classic transmission mechanism um, of the of 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 of, of um, quantity theory of money is meant to work. This is the Fisher mechanism. What? How does it work? Can anyone give me an idea? Okay, you've got a lot lot more money in 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 the in 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 the in the in in the banking system, um, and um, uh, how? Uh, okay, let let's look at it this way. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's leave out the banking system. <coughs> um, I give you an extra hundred dollars. Drops from the air. What do you do with it? You buy more stuff. What? You buy more stuff. You buy more stuff. You use all of it to buy stuff? Suppose you... Huh? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 correct. You do you don't spend all of it, but you spend you spend some ratio. You don't spend. <coughs> now, is that ratio that you don't spend? You've just called it savings. Is that 
the only thing you, you, you keep for not spending? I mean, you, you could say, you could say, well, look, I, I mean, I, I'll use my, I will spend my savings because I'll, I'll buy, some, I'll buy uh, some securities or something like that. But normally when you, well, you know, you have a bank, you, you have a bank deposit. Think of it now that you have a bank deposit and suddenly you have a hundred uh, extra dollars in that deposit. So what do you normally, why do you have a bank deposit? I mean, why do you keep money in the bank? Huh? Yeah, well, that's one reason you keep. That's one reason. That's one reason, certainly, to get some interest. But normally, on current accounts, they don't pay much interest or hardly any. They before they never paid any interest until recently on current accounts. But you do keep some money in your current account or checking account. I don't know what it's. You know what it'd be called. So I mean. You start off with some money that you've kept in your bank. Now suddenly you have a lot more. You know, you've been given your extra hundred, hundred dollars. Well, let, let's cut the story short because this is the way they thought about it when they thought about the basic transmission mechanism. Everyone keeps a certain amount of cash in the bank just for expenses that aren't, you know, that are in some, a little bit in the future. A business will do it to pay salaries once, once a month if there's, or once a week. Um, and, um, you know, you'll, you just need a bit of extra cash for non-recurrent expenses or expenses that don't come day by day. Now, your bank accounts are increased by X, a certain amount of money. And that means that you spend the excess of what you want to keep in your current account. And that's how the money is meant to get into the economy. I, I'm, I'm, it, I'm going to um, read a, a, a sort of classic account of how this is meant to work. If some mysterious Santa Claus, Father Christmas, double the amount of money in the possession of each individual, economic agents have excess money balances. They try to get rid of their excess balances by making, increasing their purchases, as you said. This raises all prices to a level at which the desired ratio of money to expenditure has been restored. Prices as well as the quantity of money would have doubled. Thus, a stable demand for real balances is brought into equilibrium with the increased supply of money through a rise in prices. That is the technical way in which the trans basic transmission mechanism um, was theorized. It's, it was called the real balance effect. Yeah? You've, have you come across the real balance effect? Because that's, 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 that's the basis of monetary theory. It's the real balance effect. Now, from this it seemed to follow that all you had to do was make sure that this extra money got into the bank, into the, you know, increase the deposits of individuals, and you would get a real balance effect. Um, that is, you'd get an increase in equilibrium national income and wealth in nominal terms. Um, and what optimists said was that if you, if policymakers boost money, uh, money growth, money by 10% in six months, then any economy will recover. Now, I don't think the Bank of England or any central bank quite believe that story. I mean, this is the problem with economic theory. It has a nice model of how this is worked, but it doesn't actually work like that at all. Um, but they nevertheless thought that it was, would work. Um, and they had a, something nice thing called the money, money multiplier um, and other little, little tools, uh, other little theoretical tools, which suggested that this would work in a particular kind of way. Now, the Bank of England um, couldn't, uh, didn't accept a simplified model. First of all, the Bank of England wasn't Santa Claus. It couldn't just drop money out of the sky. 
um, or, or handed round. Although I actually, at one point in, 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 in the economic debates we were all having, I suggest they should just give everyone a Christmas present, every, every household of several hundred dollars. Um, and um, that would be the, the quickest way to revive the economy if you really wanted, um, if you wanted a quick fix. Um, uh, it, it's actually, it wasn't, alas, an original idea. It was a rather good idea, first developed by someone called Silvio Gesell in the 19th century, which was the idea of stamped money. Everyone should be given money, a certain amount of money, but the money would go bad. In other words, it was stamped, it was only valid for a month or two. So if you didn't spend it in that time, it would no longer be legal. And that was a very, very strong incentive for people to spend whatever money. But there were lots of technical problems with the Gazelle stamp money, um, and, and therefore it's never been adopted. But I thought it might be an interesting idea to throw in at, the moment, at that point when we were really sliding downhill. The Bank of England um, specified two main transmission channels, from asset purchases to the real economy. The first is the bank lending channel, and the second the portfolio rebalancing channel. <coughs> Can you all see that? So, here it purchases bonds, and what happens to gilt yields? Gilt yields um, uh, fall, because the price, of, the price of bonds goes up, and that leads to um, the, uh, 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 you, that, that then, then um, will, will um, produce an increase in, in bank lending, um, uh, and then on the other side, um, you have um, uh, uh, bank deposits and liquid assets go up, and then um, you have uh, that, sorry, it's the other way around, the availability of bank credit increases, and, and both of these feed into uh, domestic demand. So the one is called the wealth channel, which I've called the portfolio rebalancing channel, and um, the, the other is called the bank funding channel. Yeah? Is that, is that, is that, that's how, how, that's how they thought. That's how they thought it would work. One works through interest rates, the other works lowering, one works through lowering interest rates, um, the other works through raising asset prices, increasing asset prices. Is that all? Is that all very clear? Um, maybe not. Uh, but that, that's how they thought. Maybe that, that's how they thought it would work. And uh, uh, now, they also, if you go back here to this earlier thing, the bank, as you can say, as you can see, the bank also expected um, their policy to work through expectations and also the exchange rate. Um, well, you can see how it works through the exchange rate. As the supply of sterling increases, or money increases, and gilt yields are driven lower, capital will tend to flow out in search of higher returns, calling a fall, uh, causing a fall in the exchange rate. And then there's the confidence channel. And they increasingly, when people said, look, these other channels don't really work, they said, ah, but the confidence effect is going to be huge. They'll see all this money pouring into the economy. Businessmen will get very excited. They'll foresee larger markets, more profitable investment opportunities. And in the end, confidence, confidence, confidence was um, uh, uh, supposed to produce the effect you mentioned, more spending because you became more confident, you want to spend more, you want to save less, you think things are going to be okay, and um, so they increasingly talked up confidence uh, as, as, as a key a causative, as a, as a transmission mechanism, confidence, psychological confidence. Um, well, now, I think I've got quite a lot more to say. I should perhaps just one, say one thing, um, because this is a, um, um, a, a, a statement by one of the um, 
uh, uh, bank, um, bank, bank uh, officials. Um, the bank can only directly control the short-term interest rate, but this rate has already been cut to the lowest level that the bank feels comfortable with. That is the zero bound. Another way for the bank to support the economy has been to offer this indicator by which companies and mortgages borrowers can estimate for how long such low interest rates may, may be around for in terms of months or years. So there was a sort of another element introduced into the picture of how monetary policy at the lower bound, lowest bound was supposed to operate, which is now called forward guidance. I can talk more about that later on, but forward guidance has become... What, what people want to know is that interest rates will be kept very, very low um, for a long, long time. <coughs> and so everyone now watches what every central governor says, a central bank governor, if he blinks at the wrong time, they think interest rates are about to go up. So they all rush to sort of, you know, sell whatever they've got. Um, and if he smiles, then they'll think, oh, they'll stay near zero for the next five years and we'll all be happy. So by these psychological tricks, they hope to nourish this delicate plant of confidence, the confidence of the markets, which is so fragile that it can snap even with one frown or one smile of, the, of a central banker. Um, <coughs> now, let me, go, let me go on to the last part of this lecture, which is to say, d how did it work? Um, so, the original expectation was that the asset purchase program would promote economic recovery along two channels. First, let's go back, um, two channels. First, the banks would acquire bigger reserves, which would cause them to lower the interest rates they charged on loans, and thus increase their lending. Yeah. And the second, lower long-term bond yields would trigger a rebalancing of portfolios um, uh, who, um, uh, with investors switching to assets and that would cause the price of assets to go up and that would produce, a, that would have a wealth effect which would cause people to feel richer therefore spend, spend more. So those were the two main um, ways in which um, this unorthodox monetary policy was supposed to work, quantitative easing. Well, let's look at the data. Here's a typical Bank of England exercise from 2012, which is after two years of quantitative easing, um, but it's based really on the first, um, first sort of bit of quantitative easing. Um, <coughs> so, uh, 200 billion, by this time, 200 billion uh, of asset purchases had been made. So what they calculate is that without these asset purchases, um, nominal GDP would have been um, quite a lot lower. That broad money, M4 or M3, would have been lower. And so what they worked out was that their asset purchasing program had actually increased nominal GDP by about 1% one, one to 2% uh, from what it would have been. <coughs> um, now we go on to um, some broad conclusions. The Bank of England judged that without quantitative easing, nominal spending would have been too weak to meet the inflation target. Uh, slide six shows that deflation stopped and inflation resumed around when QE started. So. Uh, Sorry. Okay. Now, here's the inflation target. Now, here is what was happening. This is when 
QE started about at that lowest point there when inflation was 1%. Yeah, and the inflation target was 2.5%. So they could say that it was successful because in that first period when um, uh, the money was being pumped into the economy, inflation went up, it actually went up um, to 5%, but then look what happens. It starts falling again. And it should have gone on going up because all this extra spending should have been by this time coming into the economy. But look, it just, uh, boop, it reaches a peak and then, so they have to do it again. <coughs> but the next time they do it, which is in 2.11 <coughs> um, to 2.12, um, actually it goes from two, or October 2.11 to spring 2.13, and they do another um, 75 billion, it has hardly any effect. So what, what, what conclusion do you, do you um, <coughs> get from this, which is that Pumping all this money into the economy does have a temporary effect on prices and activity, but the effect is actually very short-lived. It doesn't have a sustaining effect. And so you have a lot of money. And so what happens to the money? What happens to it when it's not, you know, there it all is. Why aren't they all spending it? I ask you again. It should be, that line should have been going up. Or something should have been going up. We'll see, maybe something else is going up. But the, 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 just from the inflation figures, you just find that most of this money is not actually going into circulation at all. And we know it's not, actually. A lot of it is simply adding to bank reserves. <coughs> or the reserves of companies. Um, so second um, broad conclusion. Um, I'm going to skip the next um, slide and go into asset prices. Now, actually, I think this is the next. No. Well, this is quite a useful slide, but basically what it shows is that this huge, um, uh, this huge quantity of um, asset purchases <coughs> had very, very little um, uh, I I effect on inflation expectations and that's bad it should have had a bigger effect on inflation expectations but it didn't actually have very much effect at all look at look at the um, survey of forecasters yeah inflation expectations remain very very flat all the way through the quantitative easing program which meant that there were other things influencing expectations which um, were, were, were depressing them. Now let's look at something else. Um, <coughs> here you do have a definite effect, I think. If you take this, this is the line when um, March 2009, the uh, government amounts, announces its um, quantitative easing program and you get a big boost in asset prices and, and you get a stock, stock exchange boom and so it does seem to have a wealth effect there seems to be a wealth effect the trouble is these are UK asset prices <coughs> world um, uh, stock markets are quite interconnected so it's very hard to work out actually whether it was the boom in the in, 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 in the FTSE index was the result of UK government asset purchases or the result of a general stock exchange boom which was going on um, at that time in the rest of the world. It's hard to separa separate out the ver various causal factors. Nevertheless, the people have done, if, if anyone's done well out of quantitative easing, it's people who already owned assets. That we can say with some certainty. They may not have done, it's quite unclear how well, how, how much quantitative easing was a cause of that, but if nevertheless quantitative easing had a boost to someone, it, had a, it, give, it gave a boost to those who are already rich. 
Now, what they did with their money is a different question. Now, what do you do when you feel rich? Um, <coughs> say, suddenly, your wealth has doubled, right? <coughs> and so you're in a very happy position. What do you do with that wealth? And we're talking now of, you know, big money, not 100 pounds. What do you do with it? You suddenly, suddenly the value of your house has gone up by a large amount, or your flat, or your yacht, or whatever it is. Um, uh, not your yacht, but, you know, tradable assets. They've gone up. So you're wealthier. And the idea is you then spend. And that's good for the economy. Well, OK, what do you spend it on? I'm just... What? Buy private jets. Good. You might buy private jets, and that's, in a way, a good thing, because someone has to produce an extra private jet. That gives employment. Excellent. Um, so what, anything else? Private yacht as well. That's, that's a, so that increases GDP. Yeah, yeah, fine. What else? Can you imagine? And, uh, and, and we're coming to the, approaching the right answer in a minute. Invest. Huh? Invest, invest extra money. Yeah. What do you do with the extra money? Investment. In, st in what, more assets? Okay, so you get richer and richer and richer. But how does that help GDP? Uh, you know, the, the, the thing is you've got to spend it in some way in order for it to help GDP. Now, one thing I happen to be, I'm saying, an absolute, I mean, I love art. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying I do, I do as a matter of fact, but I love art. And the great idea in my life, my great ambition is to acquire um, any, any painting done before 1900. So I buy Rubens, I buy Rembrandt, I buy, even, even Picasso will do. Um, and I just want to add to my collection. And suddenly I can. I can buy all these pictures because I'm so much richer. The Bank of England and the Bank of Russia has made me much richer. So I can buy all these extra pictures. Um, does that give anyone any employment? No. No, 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 no effect at all. It's spending, you're spending money on things, but it's not money that's not on goods that are being produced in the current year. They were all done a hundred years ago, these goods were made. Here's another example. I see that my house prices are going up. My house price is going up, so now I can afford a bigger house. <coughs> so I sell my existing house, which has increased in value, and buy a bigger and more expensive house. Is that house necessarily a new, newly produced house? Not necessarily. It may be simply a house that it's likely to be a house that's already there, that was already built during the boom, maybe a few years back, or much older. All I'm saying, the only point I'm making is that though there is a wealth effect, and the wealthier have got wealthier, that doesn't translate into a nominal income effect. Um, and that's something that, you know, you have to, one has to um, be aware of. Now, this leads um, to my um, third point, which is directly follows from this, um, <coughs> which is um, the uh, fact of the rich. Now, if everyone had if income was quite equally distributed, you'd expect the wealth effect to result in some um, uh, more, more, more uh, balanced spending. Uh, this is the distribution of household financial assets in the UK. Um, and that's roughly the pattern in the United States. And it's roughly the same pattern as in most of Europe. There's a bit more equ equality in some European countries. Now, here's the wealth effect right over here. 
isn't it? Look, this is, this is, this, this, these are the people who benefit. <coughs> right in the right-hand quarter. Um, and as, as one correspondent wrote, um, well, basically the facts are um, it enriches the rich, given that the median, median household uh, in the UK held only about £1,500 worth, let's say £2,000 worth uh, of gross assets, while the top 5% held an average of $300,000 of gross assets, or about 40% of the financial assets of the household sector as a whole. And in the words of one in the words of FT columnist John Kay, in the modern financial economy, the main effect of QE is to boost asset prices. One thing is certain, those with assets benefit at the expense of those without. So that's, there we have this, the whole distributional problem of quantitative easing. Now we have another conclusion, guilt yields. The Bank of England estimated that um, in the first phase of quantitative easing, um, guilt, long-term guilt yields fell by about 1%. Um, but some academics argue that this was only temporary. I think actually there has been an effect on, on guilt yields. Um, and I think that, that that probably was a success of quantitative easing. Um, <clears throat> and one, um, one commentator from the Bank of England, David Miles, wrote that a significant part of the fall in spreads on sterling corporate bonds is specifically linked to the Bank of England's purchase of gilts. And there's also um, a uh, and that there was a strong institutional investor demand for corporate bonds during the second half of 2009. So that may be claimed as a, um, as a more or less a successful effect um, of, of quantitative easing. Now, bank lending. That was meant to be, remember one of the transmission channels was through bank lending. You get a decline in interest rates, a greater willingness of the banks to lend and presumably uh, a greater willingness of people to borrow at lower interest rates. <clears throat> Bank lending, wow. Here is, this is all this period here where you have quantitative easing. What's happening? What's happening to bank lending? And I just read today um, in, the, in the FT, or yesterday, that in fact bank lending was down further. It, it's down by 275 billion bank lending since the start of the crisis. That is the whole of the quantitative easing program, which was 275 billion. Um, now, how do you explain that? How do you explain that? I mean, what's wrong with this transmission channel here? Down. Bank deposits go up. Liquid assets of banks go up. Availability of bank credit goes up. Domestic demand goes up. And then that's what's meant to happen. Then look at what happens to bank lending. What, what's wrong with that transmission channel? Maybe it would have gone even lower, it's true. Maybe there would have been even less bank lending. Maybe the collapse would have been even worse had it not been. But it's hardly the recovery policy that people are talking about. Can anyone explain that? Or does it lead to a question about the quantity theory of money itself? The, 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 
I think the, you've got, the thing to remember is it's not the printing of money that causes prices to go up or the economy to improve, it's the spending of money. If people don't want to spend money, I can, you know, you might think it absurd that people wouldn't want to spend money if I force money down your throat, you know, and you say, no, no, I'm not going to spend it, I don't like money, I hate money. You know, that's counterintuitive, isn't it? So you'd expect some spending effect. But then think of something else. For example, suppose you're swimming in debt. You might want to pay back your debt rather than spend anything. Or if you're a business, what does, what does, what does business investment depend on? What two uh, numbers have you got to, to always bear in mind as a businessman? First of all, the cost of borrowing, and secondly, the expectation of profit. Now, it may be that you'd have to reduce the cost of borrowing to a big zero, a minus number in certain uh, conditions in order to get profit expectations, you know, to, um, sort of to, to, to match profit, very reduced profit expectations. Well, one way of doing that is to get the rate of inflation up. But if you can't get the rate of inflation up because people aren't spending, then you're stuck. This is something that Keynes pointed out. I mean, and it was absolutely crucial that you always need to think about when you're, when you're thinking about money, it's not just the supply of money that's important, it's the demand for money to spend that's important. If you have a buoyant demand, then, then you go to the bank, the bank creates deposits for you, you spend it. The banks create the money in response to a demand. If there's no demand, there's no money creation. I'm putting it in a very extreme form, but these are the two uh, poles of monetary theory. Um, and I think quantitative easing was an experiment um, which um, we still don't know the full picture, but it suggests that quantitative easing isn't enough on its own. Now let's look at another of these um, things that is meant to happen, which is money supply. I mean, they were increasing the money supply. Um, money supply growth and lending. By money supply, we really, we're not just talking about narrow money, because we now include broad money in money supply. That is deposits of the banking system, or deposits created by the banks. What's happening to money supply? Ooh. Mind you, this is all going on at the time. Here's the bank, here it's creating enough, it's creating a bit of broad money, and narrow money I mean. Um, it starts, you can see, um, you can see where it's first, um, there's a slight increase there, but broad money is simply, and that's, broad money is the same as lending, roughly, it's the same as the last, last uh, chart. So that, that doesn't, not, not um, and, and what that shows simply is that the money multiplier simply broke down. Uh, it had fallen from 10 times in normal times uh, to 0.6 as a result of the depression. That means that the 200 billion injection of money by the Bank of England in the first, in its first uh, bout of quantitative easing, which according to monetarist arithmetic should have translated to a two trillion <coughs> increase <coughs> in broad money, actually only boosted the stock of broad money <coughs> by, by um, uh, 120, uh, 120 a million, 122 billion. So, um, exchange rate, uh, confidence, um, confidence. Let's have a look at uh, the um, measures of consumer and business confidence. Yes, 
it's true. Um, what we, we start quantitative easing right here in March. Sorry, I can um, wait a minute. Oh, I've, what have I done wrong? I've obviously pressed the wrong thing. So sorry. I wanted to just direct the red, red um, dot to the top of there. Yeah, that's exactly when quantitative easing starts. Um, in, 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 in the first quarter of 2009 and, it, and you know it maybe does boost confidence a little bit doesn't it um, except yeah but then it sort of nothing much happens thereafter <coughs> I'm coming to the end um, I'm very near the end in fact I have done what I um, now we f have the final the final sort of uh, outcome that we're interested in GDP growth. <coughs> now, I think this is really interesting. We have the big collapse, yes. Then we have the recovery. And the recovery basically starts um, in, 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 in second quarter 2009. And that's true everywhere in the world. That, that, was, that was, you could see that in the very, very first chart I showed, showing how, unlike the Great Depression of 2009, you, you were, it was cut off by these huge bailouts um, that were done um, in, in autumn 2008, spring 2009. Then you have the quantitative easing program um, started in t second, end of second quarter 2009. That runs for a year. Now, what happens? Yes, there's a bit, there is some improvement in growth. Um, and, but, then you go on, then you go on, and you really have growth of under 1% for two to three years. Then you get, now it's started again, it's, it's, becoming, it's becoming quite strong. And at the moment, if you carry that, that, that graph on for a couple of a year, we're, the UK is now growing at about 3% a year. And so everyone's saying, wow, this is a great success for our policy. Um, and uh, it shows that, um, you, know, all, you know, it shows that A, quantitative easing has sort of worked in a way, and B, that our policy of uh, tight budgets has produced enough confidence, finally, for things to start working properly. Um, I, can, I have a section in my lecture which I'm going to skip, which is on what happens in the United States. Basically, they do better out of quantitative easing than the UK. They seem to have done it more cleverly. Um, and I come to my conclusion. Um, and what is my conclusion? Um, the, cl the claim of uh, quantitative easing as a recovery policy rested on a very simple proposition. Put money into people's pockets and they will spend it on things which raise prices or, and or generate more output and employment or some combination. It may be seen as an alternative means of hitting the inflation target when an economy is in a liquidity trap. And it then amounts to attempting to drive down the real rate of interest by inflating the economy. The question then is whether it can cause the money supply to grow faster than liquidity preference, or equivalently, whether it can engineer a fall in the real in rate of interest greater than the decline, rate of decline in profit expectations. I, the answer to that is we don't know. After this big experiment, there will be the econometricians will be at work at this for years ahead trying to estimate whether it did work, how well, how well it worked, what worked, which transmission mechanism worked, uh, and, and all of this is unsettled. But one thing is certain, that its, inf that it, that its effect is indirect, not only uncertain, but indirect. It's indirect because, because it doesn't directly inject demand into the economy. If I want to be certain that a hundred extra pounds 
will work in the economy, will boost the economy, I better spend it myself if I'm, if I'm the government. If I give it to you, all kinds of things may go wrong. Um, and that's the big argument, of course, for fiscal policy, really, in a slump. Government can borrow the money from the bank. It can tell the bank to print money if it wants to. I, the government says, I want to spend money. And I want you to get me the money. I've got all these things I want to do. I want to build more railways. I want to build more schools. I want to build more hospitals. I want to build more houses. I've, I've got all these spending plans. And I want the money. Then you may have a big a definite effect on spending. But if you give it to people through many transmission channels, some of which may work, some of which may not, which depend on the distribution of income, depend on people's propensities to save and consume, and generally their risk averse, uh, uh, their, their, their risk profiles uh, at that particular point in time, then you're going to get an uncertain and an indirect effect. So next, tomorrow, I'm going to talk about fiscal policy and, and, and um, argue that that should have been the main anti-slump um, uh, measure, tool, but it was not. It was, in fact, fiscal policy in the slump was contractionary, not expansionary. Is that